So we're here after the Norman Heatley Lecture, which is the Dunn School's uh, main annual lecture. And this year's lecturer was Dr. Cynthia Kenyon from Calico Life Sciences. Cynthia's work is about longevity and aging, and specifically about how one might be able to think about using genetic mechanisms that she's discovered to extend longevity, possibly ultimately, into humans. And the first question I have for you, Cynthia, is how did you start working on aging? Ah, well, the first thing I remember is being a postdoc I was a postdoc here in England, not at Oxford, but in Cambridge with Sidney Brenner. And I remember sitting, you know, worms have a lot of progeny. C. elegans worms yep. take three days to reach adulthood. And then in the next three days, they have 300 progeny. So you never see an old worm because by the time the young ones are an adults, are adults, the old one is only six days old. Yep. And it still looks pretty young and you can't even find it. Mm -hmm. But I was working with a mutant that didn't have very many progeny. And I just forgot about this plate, the little <laughs> culture dish, and I came back in a month. And all the worms were old. And I never saw an old worm. I never saw one, but they were old. You could tell immediately. And so I thought, wow. I mean, it was a huge thing because my main project was to follow the cell lineages of the worms when the cells divide. And so I, I was with one worm. Like I would be with a worm from its birth all the way to becoming an adult, every cell division. And to think that these worms, which I learned to cherish, got old. I mean, they look so sad, you know, and then I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get old too. It's going to happen to me. And it was this big thing. So that actually, I think, really had an effect because mm -hmm. I thought, ah, oh, and you could study this because anything that happens to a worm, you can look for mutants where it doesn't happen. And so I thought, oh, that would be really, but that was before I started studying it, but it stuck with me. And I also liked the idea very much of studying something that was completely unknown. I just liked that. And this was unknown, but I mean, the mechanisms and whether you could even get long-lived mutants that were really not just trade-offs or something, but were really interesting long-lived mutants, wasn't known at all. And so I started doing that when I was a professor at UCSF. So, yeah. I mean, if you said that one of the things that worried you was that you were going to age too. Yes. <laughs> well, I didn't stop it either. Uh, Look at <laughs> But what, what was your sort of, what was the underlying belief that what you discovered in this little tiny millimeter or a couple of millimeter long nematode worm was going to have any relevance to human aging? Ah, because everything that the worm did, everything seemed to be done the same in other animals. In fact, when I was there, that's when the whole field was discovering that the um, mechanisms for development and pattern formation were conserved. They were the same in all mm -hmm. animals, even though the patterns were totally different. The mechanisms to make them were conserved. So... So I thought, and not only that, people knew that by that time that the cell cycle mechanism, actin, myosin, everything. So there was this new idea, really, that there was nothing that would be totally a worm thing. So I figured if you could find something out in the worm, there would be a good chance. Okay, so you've got a genetic system, and you think it's going to be similar to humans or mammals. Did you, what, is there some sort of principle of what you've discovered that's sort of reasonably easy to describe about oh, what, so. under, what underlies aging and how one might be able to manipulate that for longer life. Yes, I think the take home message, which I try to stress in my talk too, is that animals have the ability to live longer than they do. Mm -hmm. They can protect this, their cells and keep their proteostasis levels at high enhancement, and mm -hmm. so they, but they don't usually bother to do that any more than they have to. And so what happens is that under conditions of stress, they roll out these protective mechanisms so they don't die. Um, but then that's it. And what we've done is to just make them, we've switched them on even when the worm would not have us switch them on. When conditions are good, we switch them on. And so now they become resistant to everything even though they have their normal life. And they live you know, much, much longer than they would normally live. So you now work at Calico Life Sciences, yes. which is a Google company set up to think about longevity or yes. to tackle it at aging. Yes. Uh, are you an optimist? Do you think there is a possibility that what you've learned in worms, I mean, you've told us that the biology is very similar, but that's a long way from saying that you might be able to manipulate human aging in a similar way. Well, I think that finding that, um, three things, that the same genes affect aging in flies and mice, much are vertebrates like we are, yep. and flies says it's very ancient mm -hmm. and conserved, and so we should have it, mm -hmm. the that's the first thing. Second thing is that there are these hints that this network affects aging in people. You know, So for example, if you probe a GWAS study with not just one gene, but the network, you get a nice signal, for example. And there's a lot of other little, so I think, yes, I think that Personally, I think the chance is really, really high. Whether you could do it, though, with no side effects, which is critical, mm -hmm. I don't know that. That's mm -hmm. really tricky. 
I'd like to know more about small dogs. You know, small dogs weren't bred to live long. They were bred to go in little holes or do whatever, <laughs> sit on laps or yep. whatever. But they, as they are long-lived. So it would be, and we know they're IGF-1 muta- mutants from sequencing, and they have low IGF-1 levels. But we don't know whether that's all. You know, if you just took a dog and you just only made that change, what would happen? Would it be a nice little, you know, terrier or a chihuahua? <laughs> or is it all, or are there other things that you need to, you know, so the, to suppress do- side effects? I don't know. So the small dogs are actually using the same, the same pathways are involved in making the dogs, the small dogs live a long time as, as the worms that you discovered earlier. Yes. In other words, they live long and they are IGF-1 mutants. And in worms, if you are an IGF mutant, one mutant, then you live long. So in worms, we have the causal mm-hmm. relationship. And in dogs, it's possible that you know, for some reason in dogs, that's not the cause or some other cause. But it's the simplest explanation. In your lecture, yeah. you told us that there are some worms that can live 10 times their normal lifespan. Yes. So are we going to see a human who can live to 750 or 800 years? I don't years? know. Who knows? Do you, you think know, that is there, a, do, I mean, or more seriously, do you think there's a sort of upper limit on what hum, on the human lifespan? Is there any way of thinking about what that might be? Well, I don't know. I mean, we live already a long time. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine one thing, that we've maxed out. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yep. Or I could imagine that we live as long as we do and not longer so that we can take care of the grandchildren. Because mm-hmm. most people die when the grandchildren go into college, more or less. That's <laughs> about the time your grandparents are, yep. are dying, yep. just is usually. Yeah, yeah. So and that's long enough for them to help the parents out to raise the grandchildren, and they do that. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why we live as long as we do, maybe. And why we don't live longer. I mean, who needs you to take care of the great-grandchildren if you have <laughs> grandparents around? Yeah, you carers. don't really need them. Yeah. So maybe that's why. And if that is the reason, which it may or may not be. Mm. And I don't see... I mean, of course we'll never be immortal because you'll be hit by a truck. Yep. No matter if there's any probability, by time's enough time, that's yep. it. You yep. know? So we, that will never happen. But, yeah, I don't know. The other thing is that I think it was so stunning to find mutants that... that you know, with one gene change that could stay young in, in all respects so long. I mean, I never thought that would be possible, a doubling of the lifespan. Intuitively, it doesn't seem possible for humans, especially since there are no 200-year-old people that we know of. Mm-hmm. Especially, that could be a real... Maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know. But anyway, there aren't any. That's a very exciting prospect. I'd like to finish on a sort of, um, on the important question of whether we really want to live to 200. I don't know. And in the sense of, I mean, you know, there's aging, but there's also the diseases of aging. So can you just talk a little bit about whether what you're doing suggests that we can live longer and healthier, or whether what you're talking about is a long, protracted uh, old age that perhaps not many of us would want? Yes, that's a really good question. Sim- one simple answer to your question is that in these long-lived mutants, the diseases of aging, pretty much all of them, are postponed, and when they happen, they're not as bad. And that would make sense intuitively if there's something about being old that makes you susceptible. So in the mutants, if you're not old yet, then you won't get the diseases. So that's nice. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. And as I said in my talk, it also makes it possible to get a drug approved for a disease rather than for slowing down aging, which would be more which difficult. Which might be a hard problem. Exactly. Yeah. Um, w- but still, the question of um, happiness mm. and you know, f- you know, exercise and if you can do things and if you're cognitively there. You've got your grandchildren, you say, but were your great-grandchildren yeah. or your great-great-great-grandchildren, yeah. are you still enjoying them by that yes, stage? Yes, that's exactly right. And those are very subtle things. Yeah. I mean, you can just look completely normal but be depressed. Mm-hmm. And even that would be terrible. Mm-hmm. But having any kind of ailment, so the bar is pretty high. And so, that, so actually what people like myself and people who are thinking about translating this to humans, we're not really focused on extending lifespan, not really at all, but just really on staying more youthful. And, I mean, it would seem like really great if you could be one of these centenarians who looks really young when they're old and then just die in your sleep. That seems perfect. It sounds great. Yeah. I suppose it's too much to ask that you have one piece of advice for everyone who's watching this about how they should extend their own lifespan. Actually, what occurred to me after I've been thinking about this for quite a long time is, you know, I don't think people do enough to make the most out of each day. <laughs> I, I'm really serious. Mm-hmm. I think if you really try to make each day a wonderful thing, then you, you'll, you won't extend your lifespan, but you'll do what we're trying to do by making it longer. You know, you'll have a better life. And 
you know, so that's my, that you can do right now. Well, on that fantastic yeah. piece of advice, I think, <laughs> thank you very much for, for doing this and thank you very much for doing the Norman Heatley Lecture. <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, thank you very much.